and welcome this morning. It's good to see you all, and um, it's good to see some familiar faces that we haven't seen in a little bit, and it's nice to be able to still recognize them, so, and, and doing you well, and, and Mary and Greg, great to see you again, um, and just a, a number of folks here, and we want to welcome the Jacoby family. You know, I, you, you think you'd realize as a man, right, you get to discern some things, so, yeah, just like, and I'm just kidding, <laughs> but it's great to see you, and, um, and when we do have the opportunity to meet with, with Marilyn, it's also wonderful, too, and and your mom is it was just such a treasure to me and Patty, and we know a treasure to this church family as well. So thank you for coming and blessing us uh, with your presence here this morning. We pray you're blessed as well. So it's good to see everybody here, and um, hopefully you have had a great week, and, um, and that this week would even be, be greater for you. So um, we are going to meet again tonight. Uh, we'll get back on schedule for our uh, Sunday night study, and we're going through the book of Isaiah, so if you're able to come, That'd be wonderful at 6 p.m. And also, um, we're meeting on Tuesday nights for, our, for prayer. And um, we, we have prayer. We have like more of a devotion. We have a little study, but we're really focusing on prayer. So if you're able to join us on Tuesday nights for, for prayer, uh, that's at 6.30, and we meet in the back. And if it's really warm, we, uh, we have a place that is air-conditioned that we can retreat to. It's a really great room, the air conditioner. We just put ice cubes in our mouth and blow around the room for a while. It's a, no, it, it really is air conditioned, and so if it gets oppressive, we can get in there. We can do a variety of different things. So hopefully you will, you will join us. And um, as I share to the folks that they're welcome at Greenfield to come up and join us as well. We also have a Friday morning study. I'm going, um, we're talking about Revelation down Friday mornings, and so we meet um, at 8 a.m. So if you're able, you want to drive down to Greenfield Center, from 8 to 9, we have a Bible study going on down there. So there's a variety of opportunities if you want to go back and forth, and, and so that works out really, really well. I just said two things, uh, and Patty's like, really, really, I, I tend to say that more often than I should. But um, again, this morning, good to see you, and um, a reminder that the first Sunday in August, we're going to have a quarterly business meeting. Normally, we would meet the last Sunday in July, a number of folks are going to be away, so we're going to meet the first Sunday in August for our quarterly business meeting. So if you just put that down in your calendar, and um, if possible, we'd like to meet right after. It should not take a long time, uh, right after the worship service, but hope if nothing else encroaches, we'll keep it. If it does, and we have to do more business than we expected, then we'll, we can move it to the night, but it'd be easier just to do it right after the service and, and take care of that. That's all I have. Ms. Tori? Let's stand and worship the Lord together.
of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer
worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. And praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 You may be seated. So this morning we do have a couple of prayer requests, and as many of you know, uh, Rita's brother Carl, if you have heard, he is in the hospital, and so Carl had a, a slight stroke this past week, and Carl also is dealing with some heart issues as well, but um, prayers for, for Carl Debnan um, to lift him before the throne of the Lord for healing, but Carl is still in the hospital doing okay. I guess he's communicating to Rita that he's okay, but she's finding out from the other part of the family that he's not so okay. So um, <clears throat> there goes your brother Carl, <laughs> Rita. Uh, so keep Carl Debnam in your prayers. And also um, Mary, uh, Mary's husband, we were praying for a couple of weeks ago, Bob, who went in the hospital to have a heart procedure, and um, the procedure did not go well. Um, apparently they, they nicked an artery and so he is still in the hospital and um, as Mary said uh, we're quite fortunate that he is still um, with her today so we want to lift Bob up and uh, he was she was with him earlier and he sent her off to church and just said church please pray so Mary's here in the back and um, but keep her husband Bob in continued prayers um, that this artery will heal that what needs to be done with his heart will be done and that he would certainly be brought to, to full health and back um, with her as well. So good to see uh, Greg and Mary Cross, and Greg has just been through just so, so much with kidney transplants and all of that, and so Greg, it's good to see you again with your bride and continue to lift you up in prayer. And, um, and for Linda Ball, we want to continue to, to pray for Linda and for Mildred. Um, she still grieves the husband, of her, the going home of her husband, Larry. So, um, Linda, we're, we're praying for you. We'll continue to pray for you and, and with you. And your church is here for you, whatever you need. We also have a praise this morning. So, Connor went away to Word of Life camp last week, and he came back, and he's back here helping his Aunt Karen back in the sound booth. And Connor's going to be going again next week and uh, for another week. So, he's, he's really getting plugged into uh, Word of Life camping up there, and um, Connor is uh, seeking the Lord, but looking like he would love to go to Word of Life and to uh, be trained up there in their, in their two-year uh, program at the Bible Institute, and then as uh, contemplating even missionary work. So, you know, that was the prayer of Connor sending you, that you would get there among other godly young men and women uh, with godly teachers and camp counselors, and that the Lord would just Put in your heart um, where you need to go and what you need to do for him. And so we're going to be praying for you. What a marvelous um, outlook for your future to want to be trained up in the word of God and then to take that training and go to the mission field and serve the Lord. So we are continuing to, to pray for you. And uh, next week we are, you know, one of the things that we, we put in our budget is we want to have a youth ministry. And if we could ever bless somebody with sending them to camp. So next week, we are going to send Connor to the second week of camp. So um, we are blessed that we're going to be able to do that for you. And along your way, Connor, whatever you need from this church, your family here, we will provide for you to be, train you up in the Word of God. So we're going to continue to pray for you. So God bless you. It's good to see you again. And I know your Aunt you're Karen, she could be like doing cartwheels up the aisle here. She's so happy. So it's good to see you all. And also, um, we want to keep uh, Bill Jennings... Uh, brother-in-law in prayer 
uh, sorry, his sister Verna's husband, Steve, is that right? Uh, has just been diagnosed with leukemia. And so they have to travel a distance for the platelets, and, and there's a lot going on there. So, so keep Steve in prayer as he has just been recently diagnosed with leukemia. Abby. And for Esther Titus, so Esther is at Granville Center. She, um, Esther fell and she broke her hip. She had surgery on the 2nd of July, and so she has been transferred now from the hospital over to Granville Center. It used to be the orchard. Um, so uh, Evie has the information as far as her room number. Um, it's on the board posted there. I will share with you, and, and if, if it's already there, I apologize for, for saying it over, but um, for visitations, it's recommended that you call ahead. Um, there can there can only be uh, two people at a time that can come to visit, um, and so uh, they need to know because Esther is in a room with other people, and so I, she's in bed three. Uh, is there under, so that means that there's two other people there, and because of COVID-19, um, we could not visit with her in her room, so they have to take her to another area, meeting area. So. Um, they, they would like to know in advance if possible. If not, and you can't make the call, that's okay. But um, just to let them know if you could before you go and visit and what time you anticipate visiting um, her. And that way there they could set the room up in that time where you can go in and you can visit. But it's two people at a time um, to visit with, with Esther. All right. So let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the wonderful news of the blessing that you gave to Connor this past week at Word of Life uh, Bible Camp. And Lord, where you are ministering to his heart and the desires, Lord, that you have put on his heart, they're your desires to, to be trained up in the, in the Word of God and then, Lord, to go to the mission field, wherever that may be, to serve as one of your uh, missionaries, Lord, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to uh, a world and to places that uh, do not know him. Perhaps they've heard of him, Perhaps not, but they don't know him. So, Lord, we lift up Connor to you today. We, th we thank you for what you've put on his heart and just pray you continue to bless him in this time of, of camp and with the other youth there, Lord. And, Lord, uh, continue to uh, fan the flames uh, in his heart to desire to serve you in whatever way and wherever you would call him to. And I pray, Lord, that you'll Continue to bless this body of Christ with the means, Lord, to help young people like Connor to, to be trained up in the word of God, to bless them with, with, uh, with Bible-based summer camps, Lord, where he can be around other brothers and sisters in Christ and, and Lord, other kids just like Connor, Lord. Um, perhaps some of them don't even know you, but there they, they would come to know the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So bless us, Lord, and we thank you, Father, that you have provided um, the resources here that we can bless Connor and, and bless him with a week at camp. So we thank you, Father. This morning, Lord, we lift up uh, Carl Debnam to you, Lord. And Father, we just pray um, that you would strengthen Carl in his body uh, as he recovers from this stroke that he has had. We pray, Lord, for his caregivers there, and Lord, uh, that they would... Uh, find what caused this problem, and in the meantime, Lord, keep his heart strong as well, and, and watch over Reed and family as they minister to, to Carl, Lord. But we pray for your healing upon him, and likewise for Mary's husband, Bob. Father, we, we never know. Sometimes procedures are um, just so routine until what is routine no longer becomes that, and Bob finds himself in the condition he's in now. So, Lord, we pray for him this morning, and we pray, Lord, for a healing in his body, that the artery would be sealed up and healed, and, Father, that the, the problems that is going on with his heart, Lord, that they can be remedied with no further jeopardy to his health. And, Father, um, he has asked us to do the very best, and that is to pray, but to pray in faith and to bring him and his needs before the throne of grace. And we do that this morning, Lord, in the name that is above all other names, the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would incline your ear to the prayers that we have for Carl and for Bob 
And we lift up Steve the same way, Lord, in this leukemia that has now visited his body. And Father, our prayers is that um, it would not camp there long at all, but it would be gone. But Lord, we have no idea of what your will is, so we pray that thy will be done. And for Carl and for Bob and for Steve now, we pray for your will to be done. But ultimately, Lord, we know that healing does come from your hands. And so, Lord, that we pray for healing, not just for the sake of having loved ones continue to be with us, but that there would be a testimony there, Lord, of what you have done. And that by that testimony, others would come to know the wonderful works of you, the one true living God. Father, this morning we pray for peace over Esther and a strengthening in her body, Lord. At these advanced years in her age, Lord, um, she served you on the mission field at one time in her life. And Lord, right now, she's in this place. Lord, use this as a mission field that Esther can bring the grace of Jesus Christ into that place. That she could minister to those who are hurting in their hearts and in their minds and in their bodies, Lord. So strengthen, Lord. Make her a missionary right there at Granville Center. That many, many would come to know the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this time we've come to worship you. And may it be just that, a time that we set everything aside, everything. And our focus is not on one thing, but on one person. And that is you, Lord Jesus Christ. May all that we do here be pleasing in your sight and bring you glory in thy precious name, Jesus. Amen. I have 
lose weight that way down back up see it's okay you can laugh there you go huh I used to kid when I was a kid a kid in church in the Catholic Church growing up that everybody would sit so silent until somebody coughed and that was a release once somebody coughed everybody coughed then the sneezes started and I'll tell you it was like you thought they were Pentecostal for a moment they just broke out with coughing and sneezing and all kinds of things. But anyway, good to see you and turn with me to the sixth chapter of Judges. We are working our way through this life of Gideon and we are tracking what's been going on here. We know that um, the people have turned away from Almighty God. They have forsaken Him and God has brought His chastisement, not His punishment, but his chastisement, his discipline of his people because he wants them back. Listen, God always disciplines those whom he loves, but he does it with a purpose. He wants us back. He wasn't doing this to the Israelites to drive them away. He wanted them back, but they wouldn't listen. They got tied up with all kinds of false worship and and hanging out with, with people and neighbors that had nothing to do with the one true living God. And they got involved in this. And so that he sends the Midianites, who were distant relatives, as you remember, of the Israelites. Well, they're still not paying attention. And so now God sends them a prophet, an unnamed prophet. And the prophet comes and he rebukes Israel. He goes from city to town to village and he's telling them, look, this is what you're doing. You're engaging in false worship. You're hanging out with people you ought not to be hanging out with. And look what's happening to you. This is coming from God. You need to turn back to him. Well, the people are still having a hard time. with. Well, eventually the Midianites are really, there's this band of marauders and they are some real nasty people. And they don't care that they're like second, third, or fourth cousins to the Israelites. They are unleashing some pretty cruel punishment on Israel. Well, they begin to cry out to God. Israel begins to cry out to God. Oh, isn't that something? Who do they turn to? They cry out to God. And we learned last week that God raises up a guy by the name of Gideon. Gideon, as you remember from last week we met, he was a farmer. God called him a mighty man of valor. He said, Gideon, I'm going to equip you and I'm going to send you out to save Israel, I'm going to do that for you. God gave him a commission. Of course, Gideon comes up with a complaint. God, you turned your back on us. And God doesn't pay any attention to his complaint. He says, Gideon, this is what I want you to do. And then Gideon provides an excuse. Yet he is the least of. And not only he is the least in his family, but his, his family, the, his clan, Manasseh, is the least of all the clans. They don't have anything but what he's saying. Listen, I've got weak faith, God. In fact, my mother and father are engaged in this very false worship that you are bringing your chastisement against. I'm not a great man of faith. I believe in you. But God, I'm telling you, look, I've heard about all these things that you can do, but we haven't seen any of it. Now, pause there for a moment. Who's he speaking to? 
He's speaking to the pre-incarnate Christ. He's speaking to the Lord himself who's sitting over by the oak tree. It's, it's an interesting dialogue, isn't it? Well, that should be sufficient that the God of heaven has just left heaven and is now sitting under the oak tree talking to Gideon. And Gideon, you haven't seen anything? That in and by itself that God would come to you and speak to you face to face and you're not a dead man, that's a miracle in and by itself. The Israelites feared speaking because they didn't want to see him. Hide my face in the cleft of the rock, right? Well, God goes on and he tells Gideon what he wants from him. And Gideon, of course, when we last left off, Gideon says, okay, I get it. Here's what I want, God. Uh, you hang out here by the oak tree. I'm going to go get a sacrifice for you. And God says, okay, I'll hang out here until you come back. And he does. And remember, Gideon comes back and he's got a goat and he made unleavened bread. And he put it down there on that, that altar he had made. And, and he poured all the broth on it. And God says, now touch that which you have made with the tip of your staff. And Gideon does. And I'll tell you what, it's a sizzling platter. Just like that. I mean, it's fajitas. And um, God was impressed with that kind of cooking. And so he just ate the whole thing. Ate everything. He loved the sacrifice. It was pleasing in his sight. And so God's going to give Gideon his first test. Now, isn't it something that God never sends us to the ultimate test before he first gives us some quizzes, some initial tests to get to the ultimate test? Look what he did with the life of Abraham. Hey, he didn't just say, hey, Abraham, you got a son? Great. Take him up to the mountain and raise a knife up over him. He didn't do that. Abraham was tested in a variety of ways. And we look at the Lord Jesus Christ. And even the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't come on the scene, was baptized, and God sent him to Calvary. But true or not. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, so I'll give you the answer, it's true. Jesus was tested. He had to learn obedience through suffering. The Son of God learned obedience through suffering. So he was tested. Jesus was tested. And God never gives us this ultimate test without first testing us along the way. And this is what he's going to do to Gideon. He doesn't send Gideon and says, hey, you're going to save my people Israel. I'm going to send you to all of the masses of the armies. No, he doesn't do that. So if you have your copy of God's word, the sixth chapter of Judges, look at, with me at verse number 25. Now it came to pass the same night the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years, and tear it down, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bowl and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you have cut down. Verse 27. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it uh, by day, he did it by night. Verse 28, and when the men of the city arose in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down. Oh, my. And the wooden image of that was beside it was cut down. And the second bull was being offered on the altar, which had been built. Verse 29, so they said to one another, who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. They just threw Gideon under the bus. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? 
Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by mourning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. Who what a test was given to Gideon. Gideon, remember I said to you at the introduction that Gideon's parents took place in false worship. They certainly did. They had an altar there. They had a wooden image. So what's the first assignment to Gideon? Gideon, before you do anything for me, everybody's listening, you go bear a strong testimony to your family. Let me tell you something. The first place God calls us to is our own family. He doesn't call us to leave our family behind without Christ and go to Africa. It doesn't make sense. God calls us to our families first. Our families are our Jerusalem. And when God is through with us there, he sends us to our Judea. He breaks us out a little bit. And some, maybe from our immediate family, maybe he'll send us out into the outskirts of our neighbors, our acquaintances, uh, some of our quote-unquote friends or maybe in the workplace. We're doing what he wants us to do in our family, Jerusalem. And now he says, okay, I'm going to expand your territory a little bit. You go to Judea, and I'm going to give you a little bit more of your neighbors and your friends and so on and so forth. And then when we are honoring God in that place, then God says, hey, I got a place for you I'm going to send. I'm going to send you now to Samaria. I'm going to send you to people who really don't like me. <laughs> did you hear some of this before? You're scratching your head. I did in the second chapter of Acts. First chapter of Acts. Don't do anything until you're endued with power from on high. And after the Holy Spirit comes, he says, then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem to your own families and to Judea. I'm going to break you out a little bit into your neighbors and into the, into the workplace and your friends. Hey, you're faithful there. You're getting ready now for the next test. I'm going to hand you out into the people of Samaria. These are the people that aren't going to be very nice to you. And if you do that, I'll send you to the uttermost parts of the world. That's God's evangelism program. And so he says to Gideon, Gideon, here's your first assignment. Here's your first test. You go to your people. You go to your family, Gideon. That's where you're going to go. And the truth is that even Jesus said, there's very little honor given by one's own family. One, you'll find very little honor given by your own family. And so he wastes no time in testing God's commitment. He says, Gideon, you say you're going to do it? You made a sacrifice for me? It was acceptable in my sight? <laughs> he got done? That very night, God says, this is your assignment. This is your assignment. There's no waiting. This is what you're to do. Can you imagine? Hey, that's our first assignment. You want to give yourself to the Lord? He says, you go give, your, you go give me to your family now. And don't wait. But there was something else that Gideon was to do, literally. He says, Gideon, here's what I want you to do. Your daddy and your mom have set up an altar to a false god. Gideon, I want you to go in, and I want you to go on your father's property, 
and I want you to destroy that altar. You bust it up, you tear it down. And not only that, Gideon, not only are you to bust up that altar, but Gideon, I want you to, play, to rebuild an altar. I want you to rebuild true worship. Where false worship was taking place, Gideon, you are to build true worship to me in that very place, on the very same spot. And Gideon, I want to tell you something else. I'm not through with you because when you go back to your family and you destroy the false worship that's going on and you bring back worship into that place, Gideon, I want you to offer sacrifice right there in that place. Oh my. What was the purpose of the sacrifice? Reconciliation, atonement, as it would back then in the Old Testament. It was established by Almighty God, and at that time it was the only way to be able to approach the one true living God. And so, notice what happens here. My computer goes out. One second. Bear with me. I'm just going to do an amazing thing. All right. You ought to write. I used to write notes down on paper. But I must have become an environmentalist. And so I got the computer here. So, hey. I may have to cut some more trees down just in case I don't go through this anymore. But this is going to be this substitute sacrifice that Gideon is going to provide. And the symbol is this. When the sacrifice is consumed in its entirety, what does that symbolize? What does that symbolize? That the ransom has been paid in full. The ransom has been paid in full. That the sacrifice that Gideon is going to offer there, what? Is going to provide the full substitute. The full ransom for that day. Do the sinner. The burnt offerings in the Old Testament were a symbol of what, or symbolic of what Christ would do, that he would die as our substitute. And he would be our atonement. No longer need for bulls. No longer need for other sacrifices. Once and once for all, his blood would be shed on the cross. And therein is the perfect sacrifice, not a bull, but the Lamb of God. The spotless Lamb of God. And so Gideon knew something here. Gideon knew that if he obeyed the Lord, it's going to come at a high cost. In fact... Gideon knew that by doing what God asked him to do, he's risking his life. He's putting his life on the line. Wow. Tearing down the worship center at that time, the false worship center. Um, in other words, that's the same thing as you've just destroyed our God. You've taken away our place we can worship. And you should only expect the severest of consequences. Maybe even some kind of a mob violence or something would take place. And this is the courage of Gideon. This is the strength of Gideon. And notice the, the, the decisiveness of Gideon. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. That was obedience. He did not wait. He did not say to God again, well, I want to make sure this is you who's speaking to me. I want another sign. He doesn't do that. He knows who's speaking to him. <laughs> he knows who's speaking to him. And he does what God is asking him to do. 
but he carries out the task when? At night. Because he knows the reaction that's coming. He knows what's going to happen. Now, something is going to happen. You know it's going to happen. But he's trying to hide the inevitable. I used to laugh at times when I was back in my old profession that people wouldn't report what they did, some of the crimes that they did. They would try to hide their crime. They would try to do a, a cover-up. And I used to tell the folks, listen, the cover-up is often worse than the crime, especially for a lot of folks we were dealing with. And this is what Gideon is trying to do. But it's not a crime, but he's trying to cover this up. And I used to laugh, didn't you ever think that someone's going to find out about this? I mean, if you look at some of the things even that happen on in our own society, right? you'll have, this, this, these, are, these are tragic things that go on, but you'll have a missing persons report. And then you'll have the mother and father standing out there with fake tears, joining in the search. And they know very well that their son or their daughter is already dead. Because the father's there or the mother's there, and they're the ones who killed them. What do they expect? No one's going to find out about this? Husbands who kill their wives. Do they think that someone's not going to notice? I used to kid with some of the people that I'd be teaching in the investigations. And I would say to them, you know, it strikes me sometimes, guys would come in. It's almost like, hey, you know, they, 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 they kill their wife. And then a couple of weeks later, they show up for Thanksgiving dinner. And the family's like, hey, you know, where's Betty? It's like, you know, I'm wondering the same thing. Have you seen her lately? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Nicodemus came to Jesus when? By night. Why did he come to him by night? He didn't want the other Pharisees to see what he was doing. He was going to Jesus. There was something that got in his, got in his spirit about this Jesus. Well, Gideon does this at night. And to quote the famous philosopher, Gomer, surprise, surprise, surprise. The next morning, the neighbors are out, and they are outraged, and they want Gideon dead. They find out what he did, and they see that their worship center and that their, their, their false god Baal is smashed. The, the Asherah pole that had been next to the altar is cut down. And they want Gideon. They want, who did this? They, they get a committee to investigate. They find out it's Gideon. And they say, hey, listen, Joash, you take your son out of that house, and we want him dead. Gideon's still living in the home, and the head of the household is responsible for everybody in that house. That's the way the culture was back then. And so they said to Joash, you go in and get your boy, and you bring him out here. But the reaction of Joash strikes the crowd. Because somewhere along the way, it's amazing how God works but in what Gideon had done and in his obedience, God had touched the heart of Joash in some way. By tearing down this, this altar, by destroying the images and the Asherah pole, by, offering, by rebuilding this altar and offering the sacrifice, Joash's heart is touched. And somehow... He recognizes that what his son did is just not an act of criminal mischief. This is an act that God has called him to do. And he comes to the defense of his son. And Joash, now this is the important thing. A bull is not cheap. Back in those days. Hey, a bull is not cheap today. A worship center back then wouldn't be cheap. It's not cheap today. But this is not the focus of Joash. He doesn't say, Gideon, you know, you could have left me the bull. At least the bull. It costs a lot. He doesn't. He's not looking at this. And this just wasn't any bull. Gideon took the best bull. 
He took the first and the very best bull for Almighty God. But all that matters to Joash is this. Saving my son. Saving my son. That was the heart of Joash. And Joash, who was a farmer as well, immediately without any training, becomes a lawyer. He presents a case. He presents a case, and it's a legal case because the folks would have been right. But he presents a legal case, and he says, well, wait a minute. If we are worshiping Baal as the true God, why do we need to defend him? He can defend himself. And this is what he asked the mob. Are you here to plead Baal's cause? Hey, we need to ask the church. Are we here to plead God's cause? God proves himself. We don't plead his cause. We contend for the faith, but we don't plead the cause of God. Are you here to stand up in defense of Baal? Why does Baal need a human to plead his case? This is the question. And so he says, hey, look, if Baal is this one true God that we have been worshiping, he doesn't need anybody to defend him. In fact, if any person steps in to defend him, Baal, and he is the true God, well, that shows a couple of things. You don't trust who he is. And the other thing is, is this. He could execute you. He could execute you. Hmm. Joash was actually pronouncing something. He not only had the legal case, he was coming up as a lawyer, he also stood now in as a judge to the other people around there. And what he is saying to them is this, that anyone who stands up and tries to defend Baal, they should be put to death by mourning. You've got the night, but when the morning comes, execution is coming your way. Joash, huh, think of this. He's got some kind of a high position, doesn't he? Because he is one who is going to say, you're listening to me. Well, where was the worship center? It was on Joash's property. Where did the bull come from? Came from Joash's property. Where was the wooden idol? Joash's property. Where was the Asherah pole? Joash's property. And now he has the same authority to say somebody should be put to death if they're going to plead the case of Baal. Wow. But here's the striking picture. Look how far Gideon's father had fallen. Gideon, by the testimony of the word of God, had been trained up, was told all of what God had done for the Israelites in Egypt, how they were delivered out of bondage. He heard all of the stories, the biblical stories. He was taught that as a young boy. Who would have taught Gideon? His father and his mother would have taught him this. Gideon was taught in the wanderings of the wilderness. How God was with them in the wilderness. How God delivered them. How God saved them. That salvation only comes from the one true living God. How far has Gideon's father fallen that he would do such things? Hey, how far has the church fallen today? To try to tickle the ears of the world. That we become more concerned with setting up worship centers that are going to be lures, sparkling gadgets used as bait to hook people when the truth is 
the only one, the only one who could prick a person's heart is the Spirit of the living God. God will bring people in when God's people decide, hey, why don't we start being obedient to God? Have I really dealt with my family the way God wants me to to be in my family? Have I really done that and God's led me into Jerusalem and then into into Samaria and and then into the uttermost parts of Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world? Let me share something with you real quick. When when God called me a pastor, it it was amazing. I never, ever anticipated this was going to happen. I was in a praise team serving on the deacon board, and, and I was having a grand time serving the church, and then God puts this, this call on my heart, and so um, began to, to teach there. The pastor um, saw something in, in me and began to let me teach some of his classes, and then I would preach once a Sunday, and eventually the church licensed me to preach. Well, the thought was um, that one day, Perhaps a pastor that very church, at the home church. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you've got a guy right in your own church. Why not? And so um, the pastor left the church, and it was not a good leaving. And so who's licensed to preach? Well, I was. And I stood in that pulpit that morning, And you know something? Ask Patty. She was there. The whole back of the church walked out. It wasn't explained to them what had happened to their pastor. Oh, he wasn't there. And all of a sudden, the new guy is in. But by the grace of God, me and my brother in Christ, Alan, We went out and we met with people and we did what should have been done. And those people came back. Almost all those people came back. And there was a fruitful ministry. And then, out of the clear blue, God says, I want you to go and serve a church over in Amsterdam. Patty always wanted to go in the mission field. I said, well, I don't know any other language. And so we went to Amsterdam. She goes, yeah, you can learn Spanish right there in Amsterdam. There's a large Hispanic community there. But it began not just by saying, go serve that church as pastor. But the pastor called, look, who can, who can come and, and take my place during Easter week? I'll, I'm going to be with my wife, who's convalescing from breast cancer. And I went and, and preached. A year and a half later, he went on a mission trip. The pastor called me and said, can you come back? I went and preached that one Sunday. And the pulpit committee came out and said, we'd like for you to be considered as our pastor. Whoa, that was a surprise. Did I call or knock on anybody's door? No. Who was in charge? Almighty God. Here's the point. We knew that God was working. And this is what puzzles me today. Patty had been in that church since a little girl. Came to faith in Christ there. Baptized with her father, right? And sister, I believe. And I came along. But she had been there for 25 years. I came along. We got married. I came to the Lord in that church. Nurtured. Served. Taught and preached. Spent 20 years in that Wonderful place. Here's what puzzles me. 
How can people just walk away from their church as if it means nothing? The day that we walked out of that sanctuary, that song that Tori and I sang, Here I Am, Lord, we left that family that day, so to speak, to go serve. And we wept all the way out, knowing what God was calling us to, but we wept all the way out. I can't for the life of me understand how people could just walk away from the church over the most trivial things. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Perhaps they've had their ears tickled for too many years. Or they're being drawn somewhere else to have their ears tickled. I don't know. But the one thing that astonished me just as much was this. I had a friend of mine there say, as we were leaving, why are you going? Why are you going? And I said, what do you mean by that? Why am I going? Well, why don't you just stay here? I said, because God's not calling me to stay here. You see, God's calling me to do something for him that he's not called me here to do. He has something else for me. Why would I stay in a place where I can keep doing the same things over and over again, but God says you have done well in your Jerusalem, so to speak, but now I'm sending you to your Judea. This is how God works in our lives. But he never calls a person to leave their church lest he has a ministry for them to go to. He never does. We endure, just like families endure. But if you're here today, I'm telling you, God's got a ministry for you. He doesn't call us to sit. He is a sending God. Jesus said, just as the Father has sent me, so I send you to your Jerusalems and to your Judea and to your Samaria, and if the Lord so does, even to the uttermost part of the world. Hmm. Look how far, look how far Joash fell. Now, we may not be involved in false worship. And if we ever do, I pray God send a lightning bolt from heaven and burn this place up in an instant. But I'll tell you what. Not doing what God calls us to. We could look at one of ourselves and say, look how far I have fallen. That I'm in this place. And I no longer see the wonderful works of God. I no longer can testify to the wonderful works of God. Look how far, look how far. Joash came. And when he was done, he saw something in the faith of Gideon, of what God had done to his own son. And now, Joash stands up alongside his son and for the one true living God, God was bringing him back. His son's on the brink of death and God's bringing Joash back to him. Think about that test. And now Joash stands next to his son and says, you can't have my son. You can't have him. And he presents this case and they backed off. They backed off. But they began to call him something. They called him a name called Jerubabel. Now that's not on one of the number one names you want to name your son today. It could be, but it's not. He calls him Jerubabel. Now, break that word down in the Hebrew 
And this is what they were calling him. Jerubbaal. That's the Hebrew. Jerubbaal. This is what they said. Let Baal deal with Gideon. Let Baal deal with Gideon or Gideon is now Baal's antagonist. He became an antagonist to the false worshipers. Jerubbaal, Jerub Baal. He is now the antagonist of these people. And so it's a derogatory name. And what did they say? Gideon, you could expect the judgment of Baal to fall on you. Well, that's a laughing matter to us. This is it. First assignment given to Gideon. How did he do? He got an A with pluses all across. He got gold stars all across that. But he learned a valuable lesson, didn't he? And it's a lesson for us to learn. If we obey Almighty God, think of this, God would present with him and accomplish the task at hand. God would always be present with him and would accomplish the task that he has given to us. And so, what about you? What assignment, the assignment, not an assignment, the message I've titled today is the assignment. What is the assignment God has given to you? How are you doing so far with that assignment? God never said it's going to be an easy one. But what's your assignment? The assignment. You ought to ask God. But I can tell you, here's a little hint. Go to your family. That's the hint. Go to your own family. You say, well, everybody in my family is saved. Hey, cool beans. Now you've got to go <laughs> to your neighbors. And I can guarantee you not all your neighbors are safe. You can go to your acquaintances. I can guarantee you not all your acquaintances are safe. Not everybody in your workplace is safe. I can guarantee you that. So if you are so blessed to have everybody, everybody in your Jerusalem saved, well, first you ought to start a church. The second thing is this. Then go to Jerusalem or, or Judea. How are you doing with that? This is the assignment that the Lord has given to us. Because he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he guarantees you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, your family, in Judea, those who surround your family, Samaria, those who don't like you, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And he says, I'm with you always. I'm with you always. This is the easy part of it. We have come up with so many programs in the church. Nobody knows what their assignment is anymore. Even evangelism. Even in evangelism, we have boiled this down to handing out tracts. We've boiled it down to coming up with some pretty cool ways we can tell people about Jesus. But let me make it as easy as possible for you. Here it is. You ready? Live like Christ. Live like Christ in a world that's denying Christ. Live like Christ. That's the assignment. To live like Christ in a world that's denying Christ. Because when we live like Christ in a world that's denying Christ, guess what? 
people are going to start asking some questions. And I guarantee you, I challenged Greenfield, I challenge you as well. You take, a, you take a look at your life, where you've been since you were ever high you can remember. And you begin to track your life. You tell me if you cannot see the hand of God in your life. You start to jot those things down. And when you're living like Christ, which means love your enemies, forgive those who hate you, feed the poor, clothe the naked, visit those who are in prison, visit the widows and the orphans, that's true religion. Start doing the things that we know Jesus did. But you live your life like Christ. People will ask questions. And then you can open up your autobiography to date. And God will put in your mind and on your heart what you ought to bring up out of your life that is you're talking with that person. And begin to say, let me tell you, you ready? About what God did. Let me tell you. And not let me tell you, but let me show you. You're looking at what God did. We all have a testimony. God will use that testimony to his glory. But that's the assignment. Just live like Christ in a world that denies Christ. And I want to tell you, you tell me if you don't have opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those people. And then I'll go out with you. You can go out with me. You'll be overwhelmed at how marvelous and really, quite frankly, how easy it is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the assignment. Gideon lived according to what God called him to do in this state. And as a result, his father, who had fallen so far, came back to the one true living God. And father, you amaze us as we open up your word. And Lord, we see so much of what's going on in the world today. We see so much of what's going on in our own lives that we could call ourselves into question. But we thank you, Father. we thankful for how marvelous your grace is to us, how matchless it is. And Lord, how much you bless us that you give us opportunities, even through your chastisement, to come back to you, even through your testing, to come back to you. Father, may we take the assignment that you have given to us and to live like Christ in the world that denies us. And take the lives that you have changed, Lord, and use them to your glory that other lives would be changed to walk with Jesus Christ all the days of their lives. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Well, let
Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, amen and Amen.